Kennecott Eagle Minerals submitted an 8,000-page mining permit application in February 2006. National Wildlife Federation and its partners retained experts in a variety of disciplines to scrutinize the application and submit lengthy scientific testimony. The thing that I'm concerned about the most is that they've underpredicted the concentrations of contaminants in the water resulting from this mine. If the water treatment plant can't handle these concentrations and they have more flow, if either one of these is true, then the down gradient water quality in the groundwater and in uh, the east branch of the salmon trout wherever it could be adversely affected. By increasing copper concentrations uh, you'll, uh, you can start to adversely affect the stream by killing the aquatic life. From the perspective of, uh, of anglers in the state of Michigan, uh, that this mine I think really uh, threatens not only the salmon trout but potentially the yellow dog rivers which are both high quality trout streams and uh, both feed into Lake Superior. Scientists looked at every facet of the mine in order to determine how it would impact not only the river but the surrounding watershed and wetlands. When you read through a number of the reports they've prepared the initial thought is wow they've done a lot of work here but when you start pulling this information together and putting it on maps and looking at where they've placed data or probably more importantly where they haven't placed data, uh, the picture starts to become clearer that they haven't put these in the right locations uh, to fully understand how the system uh, flows. Wetlands are another area of concern at the proposed mine site. If we do lose wetlands there as a result of the mining activities, as I believe we will, um, some people might suggest, well, let's just go build wetlands somewhere else that uh, replace those. But in my mind and the minds of most wetland scientists, uh, that is not an effective solution because animals can't just pick up and move somewhere else. Uh, it will result in some permanent, uh, irreversible damage to the uh, local ecosystems in the Yellow Dog Plain. From the evidence that I've seen and that has been presented by Kennecott and the DEQ, I'm not at all convinced that they have uh, thought through all of the potential effects that this mine could have and really um, carefully considered each one of those and acted to try to mitigate or prevent any kind of potential effect that uh, might be related to the mine. I feel that a lot of this proposal has been put together hastily may have to do with the current high price of metals and that more work needs to be done to adequately characterize this mine in terms of its potential environmental impacts. Basically when you take on this type of mining activity um, it's a very high risk type of uh, process you're going to undertake. Unfortunately you have a mine right here that's centered in the world's greatest natural water resource and you're kind of rolling the dice right on Lake Superior. Beyond the impacts on groundwater, rivers, wildlife, and the ecosystem, another set of scientists are concerned about something more tragic that can only happen in an underground mine. The worst case scenario from the rock mechanics point of view is just complete failure of the crown pillar, the roof of the mine. And this would cause an uncontrolled situation where you have inadvertently formed an open pit mine, water rushing in, um, again, in an uncontrolled way, unremediable damage to the surface, and if it's during active mining, loss of life potentially. After analyzing core samples and other data, geologists and mining experts were shocked by how the company utilized rock mass ratings, a system used in the industry to classify rock strength. One of the biggest problems with their rock mass ratings is that they didn't assign ratings to the, the lowest quality rock, so that then when they did maps and cross-sections and the mine design itself, how thick the crown pillar should be. They did it throwing out the weakest rock. They knew that if they put those numbers into their model, it would lower the, the strength of the rock in the model. So they just chose no data and then the way these models work, they just take the nearest available data and they kind of smear it and average it over the area. Mining engineer Jack Parker has worked in more than 500 mines over his 60-year career. He is a legend in mining and is referred to as an industry icon by those who work on behalf of the DEQ and others. My opinion is that the application, that's where it all started, 
ought to have been returned to sender, that's what I put in my report, because it was full of errors and omissions, therefore not open and honest. Puzzlingly, when we read through their technical reports, there's almost no mention of these very systematically oriented fractures. Um, they seem to have relied entirely on borehole information, where essentially you're taking a one-dimensional pinprick into what is a complex three-dimensional feature. If there was a failure, if there was a collapse, of course there'd be subsidence, and the, the water table would be upset, the Salmon Trout River, at least that branch of it, could run into the mine, people could get killed, there'd be a scar on the landscape, it would be a disaster. One of the more infamous cases of the kind of failure we think could happen at the Eagle site is what's called plug failure of the crown pillar. It means the entire roof caves in, in, in one piece. And this happened at the Athens mine, um, just west of Marquette, where 1,800 feet of the ceiling collapsed one night unexpectedly. And the geologic setting of the Athens mine is very similar to that of the Eagle deposit. Including the Athens mine, or at least considering it, I thought would have been an important point, since it's only 19 miles from the, from the Eagle project. David Sainsbury is a rock mechanic paid with taxpayer dollars to provide the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality with an unbiased assessment of the mining application. Sainsbury's technical review of the mine's crown pillar stability was issued in May of 2006. It was loaded with alarming findings including the statement that techniques do not reflect industry best practice and that crown pillar failure should be a serious concern. Sainsbury reported that the conclusions regarding crown pillar subsidence were not defensible. He was asked or told by the Department of Environmental Quality, DEQ, to rewrite it and he did that three, maybe four times. And each time he omitted some of the things that he had written before, the conclusions and the recommendations were, again, to quote, not defensible, which, which means they were no good. In fact, 10 months later, Sainsbury submitted another technical memorandum that still included the line the conclusions made within the Eagle Project mining permit application regarding crown pillar subsidence are not considered to be defensible. There were far too many technical questions. The issue that they kept changing the thickness of the crown pillar from 100 feet to 200 feet to 300 feet tells you that there is an issue here. And it is a serious issue. And it's one that has to be addressed. DEQ officials declined a request for interview. But court documents show that the department still has not adequately addressed all of Sainsbury's concerns. Attorney, what's been done about the information that you learned regarding Dr. Sainsbury's continued criticism of the rock mechanics work in this application? DEQ Review Team Coordinator Joe Mackey, nothing has been done.